So I think we are now ready. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for coming to us so early today. Uh, my name is Anthony Barron. I'm the founder of Dell Management. We are an interim management company located in Paris and London, and we started in 2010. Um, I say that the topic of Europe is very important uh, to us as we operate throughout Europe and also globally. And we are concerned about the consequences of the Brexit, as you are this uh, morning also, otherwise we won't, you will not be here. Uh, regarding the interim management, uh, the UK um, is the most important market in, uh, in Europe, with uh, 1 billion pounds of uh, revenue and also the most mature. And since 2013, uh, we learned to learn from uh, this market, and we have been also very sad and worried last year after the referendum result. And you, it feels to us, actually, like uh, losing a close partner, but uh, for sure we won't relocate or close our activities and we continue our growth in, uh, in the UK. Uh, thanks also to the deployment of a digital platform on the second quarter in 2018. Uh, but the Brexit, we understood the, the main reasons, thanks to uh, Nicole Fontaine books, uh, which is Brexit, uh, an opportunity. And we all agree that Europe is sick, as nothing new happened since 2005, uh, like the, uh, I would say, the treaty establishing constitution for uh, Europe. A year ago, we built a first conference uh, on Europe with uh, Nicole Fontaine in, uh, in Paris. Uh, François Barrault, you are also a member of the uh, speaker panel. And thanks to you, Madame Fontaine, we have set up this new event uh, in partnership with ESCP Europe and Simon Mercado, so chairman of the uh, ESCP Europe for the London campus. And this event is very special as we're holding two conferences today. So uh, this morning about uh, Europe, what's next? And rethinking Europe uh, tonight at the uh, ESCP Europe London campus. So I hope we have also the opportunity to meet you uh, uh, at the SCP tonight. So I don't know where those conferences will take us, maybe in Madrid or Barcelona next year. We'll see what will happen over there. But we just wanted to contribute ideas on the Brexit um, debate and think how to rebuild again Europe and the relationship with the UK post-Brexit. So I would like to say a great thank you to our speaker panel, uh, François Barrault uh, in the middle, Charles Grant, Tim Thomas, Simon Mercado, uh, chairman of the debate, and to Madame Nicole Fontaine, and all the daily management team wish you a pleasant morning event, and my partner, so Colin Lisk, uh, will introduce the debate. Thank you very much. Good morning, and welcome again. Uh, in putting this panel together, we've got a, a superb array of, of speakers, um, and in the audience, we have some heads of industry, senior industrial and commercial managers, and also a number of people from our first circle of uh, interim managers, the Club Delville. Uh, we have a total of 400 managers who are members of the Club Delville in the UK and in France. Uh, I'd like to introduce, and it's my great pleasure to introduce um, the speakers this morning. I'm going to start at the far end with Charles Grant. Uh, Charles is director for the Center for European Reform. Um, this is an organization that's funded by its members. They advise on economic and political issues, uh, effectively a think tank, but with a very powerful lobby. Um, Charles, excuse me, I will jump to Charles. Charles is... Uh, has an MA in Modern History from Cambridge, complemented by a degree in French politics from Grenoble, so he is bilingual. He was a correspondent for The Economist for a number of years in London and Brussels. He was at that time one of the co-founders of the Centre for European Reform and left The Economist to become its first director. Um, he's been a member of the British Council for a number of years and sits on a number of international advisory boards and think tanks. And burnishing his European credentials, Charles has the honor of being a chevalier or a knight of the Order of Merit uh, in France. He's been awarded the Star of Italy and the, um, the B 
Bene Merito Medal from Poland. So thank you, Charles, for your presence this morning. Um, next to Charles, second from the far end, is Nicole Fontaine, who is by training a, a lawyer and former president of the European Parliament from 1998 to 2002. Uh, Nicole has a diploma from the Institut d'études politiques in Paris and a doctorate in law and is adjunct professor at the ESCP Business School, Euro ESCP Europe Business School. Uh, she was elected in 1984 to the European Parliament, so she's been through the whole cycle of the Maastricht agreements and the development of Europe as we know it today, and was twice elected to be vice president in 1989 and 1994, and then in 1999 became the second woman to be president of the European Parliament. Um, Nicole is going to talk to us about the problems that got us into this mess in Europe. Um, Charles, and I forgot to say, is very close to the, um, to the negotiating teams on both sides of the table and will be able to talk to us about where we've got to in the negotiations and what is the outlook. On the left of Nicole is Francois Barreau. Uh, Francois is a former CEO of BT Global Services and a member of the the Global BT Board. Um, he is chairman and founder of FDB Partners, which is an investment fund, and also chairman of iDate, which is a think tank in the, the arena of uh, high-tech telecommunications and also publishing. Um, he lectures on a number of occasions and is on the board of a number of public and private companies and investment funds. Uh, welcome, Francois. And Francois will talk to us from the perspective of a, a CEO and an investor about what it is likely to mean to be investing in a post-Brexit Britain versus other European countries. Next in line, Tim Thomas. Uh, Tim has the employment and skills portfolio for the Engineering Employers Federation. He also is a, a lawyer, a solicitor by training, and he gives key legal input to a number of employment representation issues for the EEF's members. But his focus recently has been on sensitizing industry to the potential impacts of Brexit. He's been running a number of scenario planning sessions and we'll be able to talk about what's, um, what are the issues his members are concerned about. Um, prior to the EEF, he worked in private practice as a solicitor and served as an advocate on the Crown Court and in the High Court. Welcome, Tim. And finally, we have Simon Mercado, who is our chairman of our debate this morning. He is the campus dean of the ESCP Europe Business School, based near Hampstead, Finchley Road, in London. Uh, Simon has a PhD in international political economy from Nottingham and a master's in international relations, also from Nottingham. Uh, he sits on the steering committee of two uh, examining boards. He's an external examiner for uh, international degree programs at the University of Hertfordshire, and naturally he leads London, the SCP London School senior management team. Uh, he also sits on a number of advisory boards. Um, so welcome everybody. Uh, thank you again to the panel. And Simon, I'd like to hand over to you to begin the debate. I don't okay. know whether you want to do it from there or from I'll, here. I'll do it from here, Whatever Colin. Whatever is easier. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, good morning to all of you um, for our post-breakfast Brexit conversation. It's very difficult to get that right, I've noticed on <laughs> earlier occasions. Our post-breakfast Brexit conversation. And uh, it's a great pleasure to join such an esteemed 
group of uh, commentators and, and, and leaders and to help to try to steward this uh, conversation and dialogue with you all this morning. Um, just a, a few uh, points uh, to open proceedings before I hand over very uh, quickly to, uh, to Charles. Um, I think we all realize and understand that we're still searching for many answers to many unanswered questions, and it's not just our good selves that find ourselves in that position. It seems only too clearly that many of the key interlocutors uh, in this intergovernmental and interinstitutional uh, process of Brexit are also <laughs> seemingly in a state of uncertainty on, on, on many, many points of detail. And of course, many of you here represent uh, commercial organizations and, and businesses looking for, uh, for clarity, a roadmap in a context of uncertainty. Uh, and I think the word confusion remains appropriate. We, we have some sense of what is ahead of us, but lack uh, too much detail at this point in time. And I've spent the last 72 hours in Malta talking with university and business school leaders about a VUCA world, and Brexit has been, and the future of the European Union has been pretty much at the top of the list of discussion items. And I've been fired with questions for three days. What is happening? Where are we going? What does it mean to say that we're going to move into a transition period? What will the transition period look like? Where will we land in 2019? How is business coping? What's happening with investment trends? Does the government have a grip of the situation? Is the process manageable? What does it mean for us? So on and so forth. And I've struggled, like many of us, to answer those questions in this present environment where some of the uh, red lines of the British government are clear, but perhaps the detail uh, of uh, its objectives remains fuzzy. And I said to those people, well, I'm just disappointed that you can't join me on the plane back to, to Heathrow and come along to uh, our event in Westminster this morning, because I think we've got the right people assembled to help us to understand some of those questions and issues. And I think what I'd like to do at this stage with those remarks made is, is go immediately to, to Charles. And Charles has a wonderfully intimate knowledge of the uh, conversations and machinations within government and within the European Union institutions and is probably the best man to help us to understand where we find ourselves today in the context of the Brexit process. Uh, and uh, Charles, you have, you have the microphone and a few minutes to help us all to get a sense of those issues. Over to you. Thank you very much. I'm going to try and make just three points in a few minutes. Um, my general overall thesis is that there will be a deal at the end of this. There will be a Brexit deal, but it'll be much less good for the Brits than most people in this country imagine uh, in terms of its economic impact. My first point is just how it looks from Brussels, and I was in Brussels this week talking to some of Barnier's uh, team. Uh, people in Britain need to understand that Brexit's not a big deal for the EU. It's quite important, but Merkel and Juncker and Macron are probably more worried about the crisis in Poland and Hungary's relationship with the EU, the refugee crisis, the plans to revamp the Eurozone, uh, perhaps the situation in Catalonia, many other difficult issues the EU faces, relations with Russia, what you do about Trump. And Brexit is an annoyance, and encumbrance that gets in the way, and they want to get it out of the way as quickly as possible. And they, want to, they, they don't want the British to hang around in, a, in what has been called by Mrs May, perpetual purgatory for a long time. They'd like, they'd like us to be out as soon as is convenient. <coughs> they are united pretty much at the moment, to the surprise of some. The 27 work, have worked out rightly. They'll be stronger with vis-a-vis the, vis -vis the British if they... Um, stay together, and that with some hints of d disagreements emerging recently, they are pretty mm. united. The most shocking thing about the negotiation uh, on both sides is that the, they don't think economics is very important. If you talk to Mrs. Merkel's closest advisers, 
And you say to them, yes, but this model of Brexit would be a bit better for your economy and your exports than that model of Brexit. And they say, we don't care if we lose a few percentage points of trade. That doesn't matter. What matters to us is the strength and unity of the European Union, standing by our principles that the four freedoms are indivisible, mm -hmm. i.e., if you uh, want to restrict freedom of movement, you can't have the single market. Uh, and maintaining the strength and authority of the European institutions. And that's much more important than the economic issues. And I say, well, aren't you getting lobbied by businesses to <coughs> give the British a good deal? I'd say, well, a little bit of lobbying, but we don't listen. We've been lobbied by businesses to abandon the sanctions on Russia caused by the Ukraine crisis for two years. We've not listened to them. So the British wrongly think that the Germans are driven by economics and trade matters, which I think is a great exaggeration. Uh, of course, on the British side too, which I'll come on to, economic doesn't matter either. I mean, if the British cared about economics, we'd go for the Norway option and stay in the single market, but that's not politically feasible. So Britain is going to quite deliberately go for a, a relationship with Europe that is less good economically than the Norway option. Uh, final point about what the, uh, how it looks from Brussels and Berlin and Paris. They think, uh, the French have a, a phrase they call c'est un bordel, meaning it's absolute chaos, it's absolute bloody awful mess looking at British politics. And this matters for the negotiation because um, when they think about doing a deal with Mrs May, they, th they think she might be gone in a couple of weeks or a couple of months. What's the point of trying to help her and doing <coughs> a compromise with her when she may be out very soon? They see all these competing voices in London, the differences of agreements in the cabinet. They don't know who speaks for the government, who mm. doesn't speak for the government. They think it's complete chaos. In fact, I think they exaggerate. I think Mrs May is in charge and my guess would be she'll be around for quite a long time. But that is not how it looks to them, which actually weakens Britain in the negotiation because it makes them very unwilling to compromise with Mrs May. And they, finally, they believe, and I think they're right, that ultimately the British will cave in on most of the key issues. Uh, they have to cave in because if they don't cave in on the Article 50 issues, there won't be a transition to talk about the future relationship, and that would be really bad for the British economy. So they are assuming that Britain will cave in, and that is my analysis too. We just have to find ways of caving in that are graceful and don't appear too humiliating. And I think the E will help us presentationally to do that. So that's how it looks from Brussels. There are two parts to the Brexit talks, which I'll deal with consecutively. Firstly, the Article 50 talks. That's the divorce settlement. Three issues, really. The money, the citizens' rights, and the Northern Irish border. Firstly, the Northern Irish border. We're not going to get very far with that uh, in phase one of, of the Brexit talks. We, progress has been made on ensuring a common travel area will be maintained. There won't be passport controls at the border. Maintaining the, um, uh, the Good Friday Agreement provisions. That's been sorted out. What won't be sorted out is the future customs controls that, in my view, certainly will be imposed on the border between North and South of Ireland. Everybody's pretending that they want to find a clever solution that avoids these physical controls on the border. The British pretend that, the Irish government and the Commission pretend it, but if you talk to the relevant officials on both sides in private, they admit it's highly, highly likely there will be controls, because if Britain has set the red line of we're leaving the customs union, we're mm. leaving the single market, the boundaries of the customs union, the boundaries of the single market have to be policed with controls to check that you're not importing chlorinated chickens into the EU, to check that the widgets comply with EU standards and so on and to check that, that rules of origin have been respected. So there will be controls on the border, which is very tragic for the Irish, given that they believe that terrorists will probably attack those controls. But I don't see any way around that. But that's not going to hold up <coughs> a movement to phase two of the talks, because you can't sort out the customs bit of the Irish yeah. issue until you move to phase two of the talks anyway and talk about customs. That mean, leaves two bits, citizens' rights and money. Citizens' rights, a lot of progress has been made. I think we're about 90% of the way to a deal. Um, the key breakthrough is that the, the, the EU wanted the European Court of Justice to have uh, the right to protect EU citizens living in Britain after Brexit, which the British wouldn't accept. Uh, they wouldn't accept that extraterritoria, extraterritoriality, but they have come up with the idea that the withdrawal agreement could be directly enforceable in UK law and be supreme over any future national legislation, rather like the European Communities Act of 1972 is supreme over national legislation. And the British have also conceded that British courts will be able to consult the European Court of Justice uh, on matters concerning citizens' rights. This isn't quite enough to get a deal, but we're very, very close to a deal. Barnier's people like the British compromise. The European Parliament may be difficult, uh, but I think we're very close to a deal there. Uh, 
And in fact, uh, when Coop has been meeting in recent weeks, Barnier wanted to declare a deal done on that, and, and, uh, but the Germans wouldn't let him because, and the French wouldn't let him, because, in a way, rightly, they argued, if you say to the British, we've solved citizens' rights, you would, uh, we can get in close to moving to phase two of the talks, then you reduce the pressure on the British on the money. And this is the third most difficult issue of the Article 50 talks. It's the money. Um, uh, as you, the two sides are not very far apart. Um, the EU really wants about 60 billion euros out of the Brits. The British are, they've offered 20 billion in public. In private, they're offering about 40 billion. What the EU really needs is not a number, but a methodology of the British accepting the principle that they will pay their share of pension commitments, uh, contingent liabilities, and remaining unspent budgetary commitments in addition to the 20 billion for the last two years of the budget cycle offered by Mrs May and Florence. The British are quite close to being able to offer that, but they can't offer it unless the EU says, and we'll give you in return talks on transition, talk on the future relationship. It's a chicken and egg situation, which come, who moves first? It's not beyond the wit of man to solve this. The e Barnier's people believe a deal will be done in December on this. I believe a deal will be done in December. The only caveat is if Mrs May has to persuade Boris and her other Brexit ministers to accept a more generous financial offer than they have currently made. That is a caveat. I think she will, because there's no alternative. Uh, so that, therefore, I think there will be a deal in December on <coughs> Article 50, which will allow talks to move on to the transition and the future relationship. And finally, I'll just conclude with a comment on that. This is where the EU people, Barnier's people, are really worried. They think the British are in cloud cuckoo land on the future relationship. Uh, the problem in London is this. They haven't agreed what to ask for. Mm. It's very lucky for them that the EU has not granted them talks on the future relationship because the British have not yet worked out their ask. The Treasury wants to stay something close to the single market. The hardline Brexiteers want a free trade agreement on the Canada model. My guess is the British will end up uh, asking for, as one guy in number 10 put it, Canada plus, plus, plus. Mm. What is Canada? Canada is a free trade agreement that doesn't have tariffs on most goods and some agricultural produce, but is rather weak on services. It can, the Canada FTA doesn't have anything on financial services, aviation, audiovisual and media services. It has some public procurement. So if I was the British uh, and I was being realistic, I would say let us have Canada, but give us some services access, give us aviation, give us something on financial services, give us electricity, uh, give us data flows, uh, and a few other areas that matter to the British economy. And I would say we'll pay a price for it. We'll perhaps um, pay money into your budget for the privilege of being close to the single market in these areas. We'll maybe have moderate restrictions on immigration, and we'll accept something close to the court of justice. And that, I think, is what we will aim for. But when I put this to uh, Barnier's people this week, they said, forget it, that's cherry picking. We do not want cherry picking. The single market is a package, all or nothing. Don't forget that we want to make sure that Brexit is seen not to pay in case somebody else is foolish enough to, to follow you. So don't think you can have the benefits of the of parts of the single market where it really matters to you, like the city, without being in other parts of the single market. Now, that's OK. That's an opening position. Some member states would take a softer line than that. That is the German-French Barnier position. I think the Dutch, the Danes, the Irish would take a very different view. But the French and the Germans are dominating the talks at the moment. And... Certainly, uh, I, from my conversation with the British officials, I think they really think that they can get a special deal. Mrs May said a special deal that's better than Canada, much better than Canada, but, and better than Norway, because Norway, you're a rule taker, not a rule maker. The, and as Barnier's people say, the British think that the uh, guidelines that the council was given by the heads of state and government to pursue the future relationship are a starting point for the negotiation. They're not. They are the red lines that the EU will stick to. And I think that the, the British will find that... Uh, that you will be much tougher and rougher and, than they, they expect on the future relationship. If we're very lucky, we'll get Canada Plus, but not Canada Plus, Plus, Plus. Last sentence, I do think there'll be a deal in the end, uh, because if there's going to be no deal, just think of the impact on the British economy. Think how the financial markets will react. Supposing Mrs May slams the door in December because they can't agree on the money, the markets start to believe there'll be no deal. The, the pound would collapse. Industrial confidence would evaporate. Financial markets would go into panic. The Tory party would worry about losing its reputation for economic competence for two generations. I think the British would crawl back and accept a deal on the EU's terms. Leaving the EU is just like accession, we are learning. If you try and join the EU, it's called a negotiation, that's a misnomer. You accept the terms the EU offers you or you don't get in. 
you pretend it's a negotiation. Brexit is very simple. We will end up taking the terms the EU offers us, or we don't get out. And if we don't get out, it'll be so bad for the economy, we will take those terms. We held very few cards. The EU holds nearly all the cards. I'll stop there on an optimistic note. <laughs> okay, Charles, thank you. Well, Charles, thank you very much. Um, maybe just before we, uh, we, we move on and uh, progress to, uh, to, to Tim, I think, in, in, in the next instance, maybe just a, a sort of quick question for you, Charles. Um, you, you finished there with a remark, which I, I think is very, very pertinent, that leaving the EU is just like an accession. It's not really a negotiation. Well, accessions to the EU are, of course, traditionally associated with transitional periods and transitional arrangements. And I just wondered if maybe you could throw a little bit of light on, on, on that issue of transition and what we're hearing about broad support yes. or broad acceptance of a, of a potentially two-year transition period. Is that status quo, a la CBI, uh, recommendation and prescription, or is it something different as you see yes, it? There will be two separate transition agreements. Uh, on the first one, uh, which you've just referred to, Mrs. May has essentially given in on what the EU's asking for. The first one will be status quo. It'll be called a two-year transition because everybody wants no. to pretend it'll be only two years. Though in my view, it'll be much longer. We'll, it'll be like being a member state, but without having votes. No commissioner, no MEPs, no council ministers. Uh, we will, it'll still be in the single market and the customs union. Meanwhile, we'll be negotiating the future relationship. Uh, and at the end of that negotiation on the future relationship, there'll need to be a second transition. When you phase in to the future relationship over maybe one or two years, gradually you adopt the provisions of the future relationship. But the transition won't be two years, because it'll take longer than two years for the French to build border controls at Boulogne, and for the British to build lorry parks at Dover, and for the Home Office to get its IT systems in place for registering uh, uh, EU citizens and all that kind of thing. So I think it'll actually be much longer, but everybody wants to pretend it's going to be two years. Okay, thank you. Well, I think, Tim, we'll move over to you. I, Charles made some interesting remarks about the influence or lack of influence in some respects of uh, business on, on these uh, debates and decisions. We'd like to hear from you, if we, if we may, about uh, the view across industry and UK PLC and your take on the current state of affairs. Thank you. Um, well, I, th I think we, we in, uh, I represent a business organisation that uh, has members from the engineering sector. Many of our members uh, are pan-European. They have sites in the UK and Europe, some are European-owned, many are. Um, we would agree with most of what Charles says. I'd have a gloss on his comment on the accession process, which is essentially what we're doing is the reverse of an accession process. Um, one of the top issues for our members is trade. Currently, we, we trade on very favorable terms with the EU. And actually, what we're going to do now is diverge. It can't get any better than what we've got at the moment, which is essentially what Charles was saying. So we're now on a, on a, on a process of transition, which will inevitably lead to the UK and the EU diverging at some point. We just want to make sure that we don't do that too soon. We do it in a managed way. Uh, a ter term that's doing the rounds in this Westminster bubble um, in the last month or so is on the same terms. So we're now saying we want to trade with the EU on the same terms as we do at the moment. We want to make sure that we uh, can hire EU workers on the same terms as we do at the moment, certainly doing this transitional phase. And if there's three T's that are coming from business at the moment, it's talent, trade and transition. Talent is people. We rely on EU nationals to work in the UK. About 11% of the workers in manufacturing are EU nationals. We want to retain them. We don't have enough engineers and technicians in the UK to employ. That's why we employ so many European workers. We want to make sure we can access that talent in the future on the same terms as we do at the moment, which leads on to the next T, which is transition. Um, in terms of um, what businesses have achieved, I think we've achieved um, to date, a position where transition is now on the table. Mm. We've been talking to government about transition since just after the referendum, saying you can't do this clearly in one big hit. There's no way that in the time limit that Article 50 allows, two years or less extended, that you're going to wrap up the UK's relationship with the EU. We're going to need some runoff cover, some period of adjustment. And transition now appears to be um, something that the UK government's accepted. 
I'm not sure we've actually formally started to talk about it with our EU partners, EU future partners, but clearly we will need a significant period of transition to make sure we can adapt to whatever the future model is going to be. Charles says it's going to be more than two years. Um, we believe from the advisors we've got on trade that a trade agreement will take six years plus to negotiate, um, could take two years to ratify and be implemented. Uh, we know that the European process for that is quite convoluted. If there's a trade element, then individual member state parliaments might need to vote in it. That will take a significant period of time. And we're clearly not going to do that before we leave the European Union. So transition is extremely important, but we would like, from a, a business perspective, the UK government to tell us by the end of this year what it is they are planning and what they've agreed with the EU. So if by December we have not reached a point where we know that there is going to be a transitional period of at least two years, as Charles says, then our fear at that point is that businesses will have to make decisions. They won't be able to wait until the point that the UK leaves the EU. We know from some discussions with some of our larger members that there are investment decisions that have already gone against the UK. They won't be made public, but we know that's already happened, and it's happened because of future uncertainty. And it's uncertainty about the last T, which is trade. We want to make sure that the trading environment remains as favourable to the UK as possible, obviously. We want to make sure that the trade is fluid and without barriers. Now, the model that we've looked at, uh, which Charles has alluded to, is the model that exists between Norway and Sweden. That's an EEA model. It would appear that the UK has already ruled that model out, unfortunately. But even under that model, which is the most favourable, the track stop on the border, there is paperwork, there is delay, there is examination, and there are checks. And under that model, which is a very friendly border between Norway and Sweden, we can't really see that model applying to what will be the customs union border, which is between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. And that appears to be a very tricky situation to, to, to deal with in terms of trade. Uh, I'll, I'll end with, at this point, with a, an anecdote. Um, like Charles, we spent a lot of time in, in Brussels and the European Parliament in Strasbourg. We spent three days in Brussels over the summer talking to DG Trade about what the future relationship is going to be and how it can work. And by chance, I was spending the next day in Belfast uh, to talk to our members in Northern Ireland. And I said to one of the lawyers in DG Trade that I just don't understand the situation. I, I fail to understand how the EU can have a customs union and the border is going to be the border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland and that they weren't going to have, effectively, a hard trade border, however you look at it. And her reply to me was, yes, you're right. We don't understand it either. And that's, the, that's DG Trade, and that is one of their lawyers, uh, one of their directors saying that. The EU has negotiated 50-plus trade deals around the world. They are required to apply the rules at the border of the EU. So you can see the problem with Northern Ireland. And I'll end there. Okay, thank you, Tim. Very interesting. Well, I'm sure we'll come back to those points. Um, but but I, I think the opportunity is here for us to sort of move quickly into, into Francois's uh, thoughts, <laughs> particularly around the theme of, of investment, Francois, which I know is uh, central to your, uh, your thinking and concerns. So if we could uh, hear from you for a few minutes on those themes and anything else that you no. care to address and reference, please. First of all, I need to admit that I'm not smart enough to un understand the uh, British politics. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> um, I'd like to uh, share with you the perspective of, of an investor or, or a CEO. The main thing uh, you do when you are a CEO, you take decisions. When you're CEO of a listed company, which I've been, or when you run your own company, which is the case now, you invest your own money or you invest on behalf of investors. Uh, the money. You pay to make choices, and you make to pay. Cho you pay. You, you are paid to make choices with information you have at a certain point of time. When it works well, you get a lot of money. You get famous. You get praise. When it do not work at all, you get fired, and you are shame, you know, um, uh, on the market. And if you go and say, but you know, because of Brexit. Brexit brings uncertainty, nobody will uh, listen to you. So I want to share a few ideas on what uncertainty brings right now. Let's take a metaphor, simple. It's Friday, 
uh, you organize a picnic on Sunday, and you have three cases. The first case is 100% of nice weather. So there will be a consensus. Let's go for a picnic. Except few French who always whinge will say it's going to be too hot, I will get a sunburn, or whatever. <laughs> Second configuration is going to rain 100% chance. There will be a consensus that we stay home, except few Scottish or Irish say, cool, nice weather. <laughs> but if it's a 50-50, we don't know what will be the weather or whatever, then you will bring chaos or bordel or whatever you, or mess or whatever, because nobody will decide and people will take their own decision at a certain point of time with what they want to do and their constraint. That's exactly what happened right now in Brexit. I will take three different examples linked to the sales and product cycle development. The first one is very long cycle of development, like a plane, like a car, like a medicines, as an example. The sales cycle, the product development of a plane is 14 years, and it's heavily involved into OPEX, CAPEX, people, factory, whatever. So whatever Brexit does, the program will still go on. What will change a little bit is the devaluation of the pound, as an example. If you are Nissan producing cars in the uh, uh, UK, the cars price will drop by 20, 25%. If you have DS, if you are DS, CEO of DS, who invest massively to create a brand, <coughs> uh, all of a sudden, the car costs 25% more, 20% more, if, even if you take your margin a little down. That means your car has moved up in one segment. So all your policy, all your marketing, all you know, the design of the car, um, will collapse. So I think personally for those very large company with factory long cycle, they will edge the currency, they will make sure the regulation is good through the, all the lawyers in, in Brussels, but life will go on. Second example is we need to make a choice. A few years ago I had to make a choice to install the international headquarters of my company uh, the net was 650 uh, new jobs. Uh, it was 10 billion business. Uh, I look at seven countries in the world, <coughs> four in shortlist. There was the UK, France, Switzerland, and Belgium. And what sometimes people do not understand, especially the people, the regulator, or the, the, the lawyers, or, or whoever, is what is in the head of the decision maker. They make decisions with the information they have. They don't, and there is timeline uh, to, uh, to respect. So as an example, if you are in a finance industry, or if you are in an industry which can be volatile, you can choose, and the market right now is much more open than before. Why? Because technology allows a trader to trade wherever they want. Uh, technology allows teachers to teach wherever they are. Call centers can be everywhere in the world. So when you are at a certain point of time, when you make a decision, remember the picnic. If you are the boss, if you are the person who engaged itself or herself, then you need to make a decision. And you don't care about the bureaucracy of the chaos, you know, the discussion. You take a decision. And right now, if I am somebody who needs to make a decision, I will not invest in Britain because I cannot cope with uncertainty. I will use technology. I will listen to the Erini, um, the French government uh, and the Macron or in Germany are very, very pushy to attract. So you know, there is a belly dance everywhere uh, you go. Uh, there is very good and attractive package. So on those large company who wants to take a decision, it's very bad, uh, very bad for UK right now because there is a, a triptych, uncertainty, there is value proposition, which is very attractive, and then technology allows to dematerialize uh, your business. The last example I will give is a new economy, and everybody fights to attract, retain talents to be the hub, the Silicon Valley in Europe, and UK did well, France is doing well, Germany and Israel, uh, which is not in <laughs> Europe, but they're doing the best, in my view, uh, right now in this. Um... I talked to two, um, 
uh, entrepreneur last week, they came to see me in my office in London, and they moved to London because it was the El Dorado, and now guess what? They moved back to France because they're raising money for, to, to, to create a fund, and because they don't know uh, what will be the regulatory environment, and because they have to, to do deals, they need to invest. If not, you know, they don't get their fees, and the people pull out. Now they're back to France. What I, in this current environment, when you create an app, you can be in London, you can be in Silicon Valley, you can be on the countryside, you can be wherever, it will work. Right now, it's like in a supermarket, you know, you buy milk, you buy cheese, you buy whatever you do, you, you select, it's instant. So to close that, I just want to, to, to repeat that when you're a decision maker, when it's your own money, you will always bet on a safe side with the information you have. And if you don't have information, you will take your own decision and protect yourself against the risk. Thank you. Thank you, Francois. Francois, just a, a very quick question, if I, if I may. You, you mentioned towards the end of your, your remarks the, the particular situation of um, tech-driven businesses, and uh, obviously London and particular parts of London have become synonymous with uh, fintech and edtech and, and, and more. And, and despite what you say and despite what Tim says in cautionary terms about investment in the UK, there's still a lot of data coming out showing that investment flows for technology sectors into the UK are holding up. I mean, two, two reports in the last week about continued growth in um, fintech investment into the UK. And how do we reconcile all of this? Because the, you, you're making very clear warnings about inward investment trends, and yet in, in key fast growth sectors of yeah. the economy, there seems to be some contradictory evidence that people are still investing despite yeah. this uncertainty and the threats of a, a no-deal Brexit. First of all, I'm not quoting reports. I'm quoting me. Uh, because I'm the guy who signed the check, we invest, so I'm sharing my thoughts. You will see thousands of reports, you know, to say A, B, C, D, whatever. It's not my point, you know. I don't read reports, by the way. I make always, I'm a scientist, so I read my, uh, my, own, uh, my own lecture. Uh, you're right, but look at all the investment which has been done in Germany. You need to benchmark, you mm. know, 28 members. When you look at the statistic, and of course, London has a goodwill of financial uh, center. You know, two weeks ago, I, 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 a friend told me he just sold 60 big apartments between one and three million to a bank, because the bank, I'm not going to quote it by the way, they want to have all the big guys making money moving to Paris. Mm. So is it a report? You know, um, uh, I don't know. But all the cities try to replicate the Silicon Valley model, the, the countries. I've, I spent three years in Silicon Valley. Why Silicon Valley works? Because they've organized a chaos. People live in tribes. So what does it mean? After work, you have a Stanford, Stanford professor, you have an investor, you have a CEO that do not why, uh, uh, wear a tie in a funky clubs. You know, they're just <coughs> hanging around, discussing, drinking beers, how to build a, a consistent future uh, together. So all the countries in Europe try in their country to replicate that. So the good idea in London was to, to create hubs for startup in fintech, Paris on technology and mathematics and whatever. But when you look at the worldwide uh, you know, uh, side, in, um, in the US you have technology in San Francisco, you have media in Los Angeles, you have fin technology uh, in New York, and re fundamental research in Boston. So you have four hub. In Europe, you, you, you count 200 hubs, you know. So it's not competitive at all. So we need to look at on a global scale, and as you know, everybody wants to be digital, you know, startups uh, and whatever, but it's a big media buzz rather than, than, uh, than uh, facts. And I hope London will attract because it's a fantastic city. Uh, there is lots of talents. But my main message is in the last 10, 15 years, you have the choice. 
before you didn't have the choice. And when you have the choice, you take the decision with what you see at the time, you have to take the decision. And the Schumpeter cycle of the new economy are not 10 years, five years, like the brick and mortar economy, it can be a, a month or three months. You can launch an app, have a billion users in six months. You can make five billion US dollars of market cap. Uh, and you don't need you know, to be stuck into a country. You just, okay. the planet is your playground. Thank you very much. Well, I'd love to move uh, forwards and to invite uh, Nicole to, to, to speak to the audience. Uh, now, Nicole will move a little between English and, and French over the next few minutes. And uh, Nicole, first of all, thank you very much for uh, joining us this morning. Uh, for those of you that are unaware or haven't uh, seen around the, the building a copy of Nicole's wonderfully thoughtful book on rethinking Europe, Brexit, and opportunity. Um, it's available to you to, to, to look at and to study and to perhaps get a copy of before you leave. And Nicole, maybe you could encapsulate some of your key thoughts for us in a few minutes represented in this book and maybe also um, follow up for us on some of the themes touched upon by our panelists this morning. Yes, <clears throat> thank you, Simon. If you accept, uh, I make a mixture uh, at first in French and uh, after in uh, English language. Um, and uh, Charles, translate? I will translate. Yes, thank, thank you. Uh, Aujourd'hui, <coughs> nous devons faire face, comme uh, les intervenants à cette table ronde l'ont fort brillamment exposé, à d'immenses chantiers. <coughs> Yes, today we have to face up to an enormous change. It's a lot of work. Conclure uh, l'accord de divorce, puisque c'est le mot qui convient. To conclude the divorce agreement. Dans des conditions qui soient les meilleures possibles pour les deux parties. In the best conditions for both parties. Bâtir une nouvelle relation ambitieuse. And to build a new ambitious relationship. Entre l'Union européenne et le Royaume-Uni between the UK and the European Union. Mais aussi organiser la vie à 27. But also they need to, the European Union needs to organize its life around the other remaining 27 members. ISCP Europe and Delville Management ont pris l'initiative de cette journée ici à Londres pour réfléchir à cet événement historique. So we, uh, uh, Delville and the ESCP have taken the initiative to organize this day to discuss the historic events that lie uh, before us. Je les en félicite. Et ce matin, uh, dans un premier temps, avec vous, chers amis, et à l'initiative plus spécifique de Delville Management, start-up dont je salue les performances, cher Anthony uh, Baron, uh, nous nous adressons plus particulièrement aux entreprises euh, qui, des deux côtés du Channel, ont des préoccupations légitimes. So we're addressing today the preoccupations of companies who are, have got activities on both sides of the Channel, effectively. And she kindly salutes Delville Management as a, a rapidly growing startup Cet representative. Cet après-midi, au campus de ISCP, Londres, que dirige avec Maestria Simon Mercado, que je salue amicalement, nous parlerons euh, du futur de l'Europe devant un public euh, qui sera peut-être plus universitaire, mais vous êtes évidemment cordialement invité. And this afternoon, at the Hampstead campus of the ESCP, there will be a debate on the future of Europe post-Brexit, and you are cordially invited, should you wish to come. It is on the 14th of June, 2016, that uh, we published a book with a European journalist, with a title that could seem provocative, Brexit, uh, opportunity, with a question mark, of course, but uh, above all, with Rethinking Europe as a subtitle. 
I have proposed to ESCP students to take part in this reflection if they wanted to. Uh, their testimony is always liked by everyone who had to read the book. As you see, the director of ESCP Europe, Frank Bournois, wrote the preface. But uh, developing um, <coughs> that uh, the exist of uh, Britain could be an opportunity, above all coming from the <coughs> former president of the European Parliament, uh, could highly surprise uh, at a time when uh, many uh, crossed their finger for uh, remain. And yet, this is my profound conviction. This conviction is based on the realistic uh, perspective that uh, I have for the state of the European Union. Indeed, uh, the European project has been unfortunately uh, broken uh, during the past uh, few years uh, to the point of a profound uh, loss of interest from an important part of the citizen. In the book, we are not very kind, and we explain with uh, sadness and, and um, lucidity uh, why smoke gets in uh, the European eyes. The technocracy slide, the use of Europe as a, a scapegoat, the Yule uh, liberal uh, drift, uh, disparate uh, Europe uh, was in crisis. <coughs> the disappointment expectation in field where citizens had a wish of Europe. The disastrous management of crisis. Uh, firstly, the management of the financial crisis with the severity imposed by Bruxelles in the most ever brutal way, um, as countries such as uh, Greece, Portugal, uh, or Spain, shattering the European idea of the citizen when it was as strong at the beginning. Then the migrant crisis, which uh, has a show the egotism uh, in each uh, and uh, every one the powerlessness of Europe and the worrying loss of uh, value. Consequently, the European Union appears without uh, direction of, or vision, and uh, since a uh, few years now, there is no more pilot in the plane. Faced with this situation, I was profoundly convinced that the, if Brexit becomes a reality, <clears throat> it will be an opportunity, the opportunity to think over Europe. Of course, we have not forgot the part Britain took during the two world wars. Everyone has a British friend. Uh, mine are exceptional and uh, truly European. But uh, we took uh, into uh, account the reality of things. Britain's involvement in Europe has always had a dilemma, and uh, from the beginning, uh, their entrance rested on a voluntary issue mistake. So, at every step, step uh, we got around the problem by um, opt-out opt -out of Schengen, opt out of a single currency, opt out of a social policy, of the charter of a fundamental right, uh, in the justice uh, area, and uh, opt out of the budget policy. And uh, we remember certainly the famous declaration of uh, Margaret Thatcher, I want my money back. But uh, more serious, uh, they have always uh, blocked all sorts of progress in less necessary, uh, but still sensible areas, uh, uh, fiscal harmonization, 
uh, social uh, disparity. Uh, they have tried and uh, succeeded at the, um, imposing uh, the, uh, at, at the European Union uh, their conception of uh, Anglo-Saxon uh, liberalism. Indeed, the European Union has uh, to face several of issues. Uh, climate uh, change, uh, the weakness of growth and employment, the migratory uh, crisis, uh, terrorism, uh, the rise of uh, populism, uh, and the election of uh, the new president of uh, the United States. My conviction, none of our state can bring alone a good solution. Alors, pour relancer la croissance, euh, so c'est dans, ce, dans ce contexte que le projet européen doit revivre comme une impérieuse nécessité. So the, the necessity, the the uh, overriding necessity in Europe is to relaunch growth. Pour affronter le Brexit et relancer uh, l'Europe, les États membres doivent d'abord uh, rester unis. So to deal with Brexit and to relaunch growth, the remaining 27 members need to remain united. Uh, dans ce cadre, la France et l'Allemagne, pour des raisons historiques, porte plus particulièrement la responsabilité euh, du devenir de l'Europe. And in this context, it's France and Germany, the historical twin pillars who have the responsibility and are taking the responsibility to drive forward the framework for Europe in future. Mais la solidarité doit être totale à l'égard des pays du Sud, l'Espagne, l'Italie, le Portugal, la Grèce, qui sont des partenaires à part entière et qui font pleinement partie de la réalité de l'Europe. But it's absolutely necessary to maintain the solidarity, particularly with the southern countries in Europe, Greece, Portugal, Spain, Il faudra and réfléchir Romania. à la façon de concilier l'exigence de rigueur et la relance nécessaire de la croissance. And we need to find a balance between the necessity for uh, what the French call rigor, or uh, what's the word for rigor in English? Uh, rigor. Fiscal rigor. Fiscal rigor, effectively, with the need also to grow and relaunch growth. Trois uh, domaines uh, me semblent uh, prioritaires uh, pour relancer uh, l'Europe. Uh, three areas that are absolutely necessary. La croissance et l'emploi. Growth and employment is one. La sécurité intérieure et extérieure. Security, both within the states and at the borders of Europe. Et le rayonnement de l'Union européenne à travers le monde. And <coughs> the expansion and uh, presence of the European Union across the world. Il ne s'agit là que de quelques pistes uh, destinées à contribuer à notre débat. These are just a, a few ideas to contribute to our debate this morning. But uh, <coughs> if you accept, uh, at the end, a joke. When I was president of European Parliament, during my uh, official visit in uh, Great Britain, of course, I met the Queen. And uh, we spoke uh, with, uh, I, I spoke with them of uh, Euro. And the queen said to me, but uh, if the euro is a success, we enter. And um, more later, I make a terrible mistake. Terrible mistake. During an interview with the European Voice, uh, I answer at the journalist, and I give this information. And the day after, my uh, British colleague Conservateur, were furious against me, <laughs> but it was not a joke. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much, Nicole, and, and thank you, Colin, also for uh, for assisting and taking us through. Thank you very much.
Now, I'm, uh, I'm very conscious that time pressures are upon us, and, and I think, uh, Anthony, Colin, with your agreement, I think we'll, we'll use the remaining time that we do have to take questions from our, uh, from our audience members. And uh, therefore, it's an invitation at this stage to, to, to please pose a question or make a comment, uh, and I'm sure you can direct that to one or other of our panelists, or, or maybe the panel as a whole will chip in. Please, I, I, do we have a microphone going around the room? And this we do. So the gentleman uh, pretty much straight ahead of me towards the rear of the theater, and then I'll come to you, sir, immediately afterwards. And Colin, if you just, we'll take this as far as you want us to in terms of timing, and you, you maybe give me a prompt when you think it's the right moment to wrap things up. So please introduce <coughs> yourself very quickly and Hello, present your thoughts or questions. My name is Ichaz Nabi. I'm chief executive of a company called Active Assistance. We're a care provider in the UK. I was particularly um, fascinated by Charles's comments and his um, assertion that in the end we would settle the divorce bill in terms of the payment because there was no other choice. But I think the history of the Conservative Party over the last 30 years has been one that has sort of led us to this situation. The acrim mm. acrimony within the party is such that it's almost impossible for any of them to agree. And the idea that Mrs. May will accept 40 billion, 30 billion, whatever it is, when there are Conservative members of Parliament who are saying the European Union should be paying us money um, for the excess payments we've made over the last 40 years, um, seems to me um, to, to, to be the sticking point. I, I, I genuinely believe that we will not get a deal because I think that we will get stuck on that point and there will be um, the, the, the right of the Conservative Party will be flanked by the likes of Mrs. Farage and co, aided and abetted by the media, the press in this country, which is virulently anti-European. And I, and, I, and I fear for what will happen next as a result of that, because if we don't get past that first hurdle, we won't get anywhere. Charles, I think that one's okay. for you in the first um, instance. Well, you, you may be right. Uh, it's possible. That's certainly a view of some people in Brussels. <coughs> Mrs. May is too weak to impose the compromise is necessary on her party. I would say she's already done some of them. She's imposed a compromise on the transition. Boris, one mm. of his red lines was, will never accept the European Court of Justice in the transition. Well, he has now. Boris has climbed down on that. So the, e the Conservative Party is right behind some of them reluctantly transition on the EU's terms. They, they say they're right behind the Florence speech. Boris says he agrees with every, every comma and full stop in the Florence speech. The Florence speech said 20 billion plus, in addition, other financial commitments that we owe you. So, you know, I think I, I, I don't think Mrs. May's um, offer need be unacceptable to most Tories. There'll be some Tory rebe rebels on the back benches, but, but most of them will ultimately accept it because I think they don't want to get rid of Mrs. May at the moment because the, the, sque the skeptics are scared that her replacement could be a Remainer, and the Remainers don't want to get rid of her because they're scared that her replacement could be a, a Lever. So I think she's stronger than she looks. But you may, but you, but you may be right. Thank you very much. Gentleman towards the front here. Yeah. Microphone down to this third row, please. And again, please introduce yourself as you present your thoughts or your question. Hi, Toby Tarsi. Uh, I work with a lot of uh, private equi equity-backed businesses across Europe and in the UK. Um, the landscape in Europe has changed a lot. Europe is not what it was with the migrants coming in. And if you look at the uh, borders of Europe and you look at the countries that are that Germany and France are primarily supporting Greece for example that crisis has not gone it's just been pushed underneath the carpet now there are a lot of issues around borders and I think the border is one of the biggest impacts you, you're going to see in Europe but also the landscape of business is changing dramatically we are moving to an economy where we're going to have a lot of unemployed people because the workforce, the landscape there is changing with artificial intelligence, automation, and all sorts of things. So the new business world is more on the digital side. Now, from the Brexit talks, what is the view now that we're looking at uh, NAFTA breaking up? That's, we're consolidating back. We're moving back into our borders. You look at China. They've been throwing out uh, products out in the market that have been uh, killing our economy. Look at the steel industry. So there's certain things happening around the global, from a global landscape. Now, how is Brexit actually looking for that eventuality that 
Things are evolving. It's not what we see today. It's what's it going to be tomorrow. And I think both parks, both sides, will be inundated with problems, bigger than we think. And I think the discussions on the table are not necessarily addressing that. So I think I would like to ask the question to Charles, how is that being addressed from a global scale? All the uh, activities around the world and the political ch the climates changing with Trump, especially. And Francois, from a business perspective, how do you see the economies of the world working? Because borders aren't there anymore. We have digital means of now uh, moving around. And I've referenced uh, a book I've read, and I know the author quite personally, Tim uh, Marshall's uh, Prisoners of Geography. The new, the new, uh, the new, new challenge is digital and it's space. I think I, other panelists will probably have a better, better steer than me on that. Just very briefly, um, I think you're quite right. It's that people aren't in the Brexit negotiations. Nobody's worrying about the future structure of the global economy. It's not what's on the agenda. Um, but uh, there is a bit of complacency in, e, amongst EU leaders at the moment because the Eurozone economy is growing, because even Italy is creating jobs at the moment, because unemployment's going down across the Eurozone and the Eurozone is actually growing faster than Britain. There's a bit of complacency about the long-term challenges. I think they would answer your question by saying, um, look at the trade deals we're doing. The EU's you know, opening trade negotiations with Australia and New Zealand. It's concluding them with Japan. Concluded, uh, it's op nearly concluded them with, with Mercosur. They would answer that part of the answer, they'd say that part of the answer is, is trade. But I think there's complacency, and you're right, not enough people are thinking about the long-term challenges. But other, I think other panelists, yeah, yeah, yeah. Francois and have a better Tim, view. Yeah, I think you uh, raise a very important point. Um, I start to work in uh, digital industry 40 years ago. I was 16, and I got my first computer. So I was very lucky to see all the evolution. Um, we grew up. I grew up, uh, not to say we, but the guy who is no hair or uh, white hair in, in the room. We grew up in an environment where there was two things uh, which has dramatically changed. First of all, uh, the knowledge was for the happy few. When you're the boss, you know more than your team. So there is a hierarchy on knowledge. And second, if you had to go to Italy or, or Spain, you would go through the customs, and you went through the, um, uh, you had to, to have a passport. Now, um, things have changed uh, dramatically. First of all, knowledge is a commodity. Everybody has the same level of knowledge. So it's not a tool to discriminate, discriminate people. So when you are the boss, your status doesn't give you um, the right to know more than your team. And knowledge has been an asset which is shared by the young generation. Look to Facebook or all those social networks, as soon as you do something, you know about something, or the searchers, they share. So we move from I know I am, as a status, to I know I share. Coming back to the boundaries, the digital uh, revolution has created a very important mindset for the young generation. There is no boundaries. Why? Because they communicate with friends all over the world. The boundaries are the inertia of the old generation. But in the mindset of the young people, there is no way to have boundaries and, and countries and whatever. It's just a community with different color, uh, different language, whatever. But they all belong to the same community. So my view is very simple. The society will not change, will not be changed by people like, like us. Why? Because we do offset. We change things, we trade, we try to negotiate a little bit and whatever. I'm very optimistic like you, there will be a deal, because a no deal will be a catastrophe. But the big wave will be done by our kids, by the young generation, who are already working very differently right now, and also are living differently, traveling differently. And at some point of time, this notion <coughs> of physical boundaries, like knowledge, will disappear, because the kids are growing in a very different state of mind. Like companies, we've moved to, from org chart, Everybody has a status to SOC chart. The SOC chart is association of knowledge community working openly on things, on goals, and whatever. So the revolution will not come by us because we're too old or we're too mentally constrained to try to preserve the past. It will be transformed by, uh, by the young generation. That's my, uh, that's my view. 
Yes, please. I, I don't think we should lose sight of the fact we're in the IMEC E today. Mm. Um, and the Bloodhound poster is over there. The Bloodhound poster, if you don't know, that's a, uh, a program that runs among schools, amongst children, to inspire them for the next generation of engineering and manufacturing. And the next generation, as I said, is going to be digitally based. It's going to be 4IR, the fourth industrial revolution, where it could be designed anywhere in the world. It could be manufactured potentially anywhere in the world, and it might not need a person to manufacture it. For our members, for some of the members, they're man 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 manufacturing now without anyone there at all. They run with the lights out and the machines run, and it's all run from China or the US or anywhere else. The Bloodhound's a good example of that inspires young people, but I couldn't agree with you more. It'll be the next generation that see that big change. Whilst you know, we all got a mobile phone, I'm sure, you know, we're not as good as our children. And it, in, in answer to your question, is, is the EU looking at that level? No, it's not. And quite clearly, the discussion here today is a very insular discussion. A discussion about old themes, about the four freedoms, about the single market, about trade and customs, and we still look at boundaries that young people don't recognise anymore. Thank you very much. Um, Do I we think, have time for uh, Well, question? no, I think I, th I hate to disappoint uh, <coughs> audience members, but, but I'm, I'm conscious of timing and we're closing in on 9.40. So, um, Colin, I'm, I, I really just before I hand back to, to, to your good self, maybe I could uh, uh, invite our, uh, our audience members this morning to uh, show a note of thanks and appreciation for our, for our expert panel. Please join me in... <laughs> in acknowledging their contribution this morning.